Um, we have a great speaker this morning, Paul Winsky from Harris County will be presenting on ornamental grasses. Uh, make sure to have your uh, video turned off and your microphones muted. That will make things uh, run so much smoother. And if you have questions, put them into the chat and our team of experts will do their best to try to help assist you. So with that being said, um, make sure that you tune in next week for um, our next, um, not next week, but two weeks from now for the next um, segment, and that will be on Lantanas. Um, and at, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Winsky. Paul? All right, Kevin, well, thank you very much. It is good to be here today. Uh, and uh, just, uh, Kevin didn't even give his own plug. He will be doing the presentation in two weeks on Lantana varieties for the Gulf Coast. So um, it is great to be here. Uh, we are recording this, uh, so that is in place. So let's jump into this and get started. All right, so ornamental grasses for the landscape. Um, why do we want to use them? Uh, and, and I would say probably in the past 10 years, uh, they've become more popular. They, they had been overlooked prior to that. When I first moved here, uh, uh, late nineties, uh, to Texas, uh, there wasn't a lot in the industry. Um, and it was sort of the tried and true ones that were, we always saw. And so for, for quite a while, they were overlooked. One of the things they do bring to the landscape is that unique foliage and, and flowering. Uh, and I always talk about interest. Um, gardening here in the Gulf Coast, we can have uh, interest throughout the year, seasonal interest, whether it's foliage, flowers, seeds, things like that. And, and the ornamental grasses fit that bill. So um, it, it, it's a, a unique way uh, of, of bringing a, a different aspect, um, some other features and, and benefits uh, into your garden. They are quite adaptable. So we can use them in borders, we can use them in uh, combinations, we can use them in, in perennial beds. Uh, and then as this uh, image in the middle shows, uh, they are a key component for green roofs. Uh, and, and this is a, a definitely a, a big area uh, where th uh, the grasses, along with uh, things like uh, sedums and echeveria, are all becoming quite popular and being incorporated now, especially into the urban landscape. So uh, ornamental grasses is a, is a is sort of a catch-all phrase. Uh, there are three families uh, that make up this this group of ornamental grasses. So the true grasses, uh, as we would see here in this, this first image on the uh, left, is, is, is part of the Poaceae family. Uh, so your typical turf grass lawns fall into that Poaceae family. And then we have the Rush family or Juncaceae, which is up here in the upper right corner. Usually these plants um, prefer wet feet. They'll be bog type plants and things like that. Uh, and they do contribute having uh, distinct uh, forms uh, in the landscape. And then the last one is the sedge family, uh, Cyperaceae in this lower corner here. Uh, again, another one probably prefers more of the shade uh, and a lot of them prefer moist conditions. So uh, these three families really make up the ornamental grasses uh, that we will be talking about here today. Um, they are diverse, and so depending on what you need or what you are looking for in your landscape, you can use them as a specimen. Uh, some of these plants can get, you know, six to eight feet tall. They can be quite striking, uh, so you want to make sure you've got the space for it, but you can use it as a specimen. You can treat them like animals. Uh, some of the smaller ones, you can plant them in groups uh, or in waves uh, and get that dramatic effect. Um, the large ones can also be used for screening or privacy. So uh, there are a lot of options there uh, with how you can use them. Uh, and if you're dealing with uh, slopes, you know, or, or eroded areas, these ornamental grasses will work extremely well. The one takeaway I think you want to, uh, uh, you know, when you leave this or, or after, at the end of it is, you know, the grasses add a dynamic touch to the landscape. Um, they are, uh, it's, it's not a static plant, uh, like your woody plants and things like that, uh, as the wind blows and, and as things, um, 
as they mature and as they flower and as they set seed, they're, they're, there's always something unique about it. Uh, and that's one of the things that I really like about using these ornamental grasses uh, in those beds. And the growth habits, just like how we can use them, um, again, as ground covers, low growers, we can have them as intermediate shrub types. Uh, and then we can have the taller ones as a head. So there's a lot of diversity. There's a lot of flexibility. So it really just depends on what you are thinking of um, as to how you can use uh, some of these ornamental grasses uh, in the garden. What are the benefits? Um, low maintenance and low fertilizer. So you can't beat that. Um, you know, they, they only need pruning once a year, and it's usually late winter uh, before that new growth. So the end of February, beginning of March, somewhere around there, um, you want to come through and, and, and prune these back. Uh, and they don't need, they're, they're not heavy feeders, uh, if, you, if you really look at it. Um, applying uh, some 10-10-10 to whether it's a clumping type, maybe one to one and a half cups per plant. Again, depends on the size of that clump and how big that plant is. Uh, and if you've got the ground cover types, two to three pounds of 10-10-10 per hundred square feet. And that's it. Um, you know, there's not a lot of issues uh, when 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 dealing with these ornamental grasses uh, once you have them established in the garden. Um, they do tolerate a broad uh, array of vi environmental conditions, so uh, we can use them if we if we're in a uh, in a heat or drought uh, type state. Um, they perform well. There's ornamental grasses for boggy or wet areas. Um, one of the things is, especially for the Gulf Coast, is uh, a lot of these will do extremely well uh, if you are in a uh, beach or coastal area. So in where certain plants will take a hit from uh, that salt spray and, and some of those issues, um, uh, some of these ornamental grasses work extremely well uh, there and, and can provide you. And, and think about all the debris and the wind that you get along the beaches there. Uh, you know, these grasses will just uh, move and sway with that and, and, and add a nice effect. Um, predominantly full sun, there are ones that do well in the shade though. And so if you've got shaded areas where you are dealing with, um, say you've got ferns and things like that, uh, a lot of these ornamental grasses um, will work there also. There's very little in the way of insect or disease issues. Uh, especially insects. I have not seen, uh, in all the years I've been in, I haven't seen a, a major issues with insect pests uh, destroying or, or feeding on these. Um, diseases, there's a few, you might get a little bit of rust on them, but in general, they are quite uh, disease resistant, disease tolerant. Uh, they establish quickly, you plant them in the spring, even by midsummer, um, they, are, they are off to the races. So, um, very easy, very good plant uh, uh, to get established and, and get into the garden. And you know, we the other thing we want to remember is they are a food source when they flower and set seed. Um, they are a food source for wildlife and also a nesting habitat. So you know, we can bring in uh, some of those beneficials and some of the uh, you know wildlife that we we can enjoy um, into the garden by having some of these ornamental grasses uh, in there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, maintenance is, is, is quite easy. Uh, the biggest chore for this um, and for proper growth is that pruning. Um, and we want to do that late winter, as I mentioned, uh, before new growth starts. And you want to prune it down to, depending on the size of the plant, it, it, uh, you know, somewhere in that six to eight, maybe even 10 inch range. Um, I did do a video on this this past uh, winter or early spring. Uh, so you can either, one of two things, there's uh, a link here, and, and I believe I, uh, it's in the resource link that um, the team behind the scenes can post in the chat. Or if you have a Q QR code uh, reader, uh, you can scan that. But it, it just shows um, really how quickly um, you can do it. And uh, this image down here below, we can see how tall that plan is. And they tied it off, uh, and they just came through and uh, used some hedge clippers to uh, prune it back and that's that's probably about 10 inches or, or so and and really that's it um, I use mine I once that the tops are cut I, I use it as a mulch I just lay it spread it out over the garden uh, and and you know uh, 
let it decompose on its own uh, right then and there. So um, this is it really for the whole season. Um, one haircut once a year, uh, you can then come through and add some fertilizer once you start to see that growth. And uh, uh, that's it. You're off to the races and you can start to enjoy uh, those plants as they uh, emerge. Um, when considering ornamental grasses, of course, we want to consider the growth form. Um, uh, and, and some of these have more of an upright habit. Other ones are clumpers. Um, some of them actually they change form throughout the season. So as they first emerge and, and start to grow, you might have a more tight vase uh, of habit to it. Uh, and then as it matures and, and starts to put out more growth and, and starts to flower, it may open up more. So you have a mounded habit. Uh, so the, they do change uh, some of these. Uh, so it's interesting to, to see. And, it, and, and it, again, it brings you out into the garden to enjoy it. Um, be aware, as with any plant, uh, what the mature size is going to be. Don't try to jam a, uh, a, a plant that's going to get six to eight feet tall into a small spot where um, you're really not going to appreciate it. It will probably grow there because these are pretty tough plants, but, you know, get the right plant for the right place. Um, and um, there's a couple references and resources out there that the guys will post um, that can help you with that. The foliage, there are evergreen varieties and there are deciduous ones. So you've got to be, you know, aware of that. Do you want something that stays green or is, is has a variegated foliage throughout the entire growing season? Or is it something that, you know, will brown up, uh, you know, during the winter and you're going to have to come and prune in the spring? The foliage color is, is really where some of the uh, advances have come in with regard to variegation. Um, we've got uh, vertical variegation. We've got horizontal variegation. So th these things are doing extremely well uh, with being able to add unique foliage and color uh, into the landscape. And then time of flower is normally uh, summer, mid to late summer, uh, and then into the fall. So you will see that um, throughout the season. Again, enjoying the, the flowering time when it sets seeds, um, that unique interest in the, in the garden. Uh, here's just an example of some of the foliage color. And you, you can see how these colors just really pop. So if we start um, from left to right, you can see green central variegation with, with uh, the uh, uh, edges showing that yellow or golden color. Um, we can see the second image where we have the horizontal banding, which is really something unique. And so it, it just gives you a different striping. We've got this uh, bluish uh, foliage type look to it where it's got a nice drooping habit. And then this uh, screaming yellow chartreuse gold color that really pops. So depending on what you're looking for, uh, as I, you know, as I tell people when I'm, I talk about annuals, ornamental grasses are, can now offer that same type of effect. Um, and then the flowers and the seeds. Uh, you can see how uh, this will add to the landscape and the uniqueness to it. Some of them sort of nod and, and, and hang and, and droop where other ones are upright. Uh, some of them are, are, are more, um, you know, wiry like in their presentation. And then you've got these where you've got these clusters that, that just sort of, uh, you know, hang in the wind. So um, the flowers and the seeds, again, unique interests that can be brought into the landscape. Um, growth forms, there's basically two types. We have what we call our clumpers. Um, these will increase in size over time, um, just getting wider uh, as they mature. And so over time, depending on the space or you know, how your landscape is or how your beds are, you may have to come in and divide them every now and then. Uh, these could be great pass along plants. You can, you know, easily divide them and, and, and spread them out in your garden and, and increase that number. Or we have uh, the spreaders, which would be, you know, similar to our turf grass. Um, these will increase in width. They're going to be lowered to the ground. Normally they'll put out either rhizomes or stolons and then uh, new plants will emerge there. So um, two types of growth forms in general uh, for these ornamental grasses. So um, let's get into what varieties are out there, what species are out there, how you can use them, 
uh, and, and work our way through this. So the first is Acorus graminus, or common name is sweet flag. And you can see this is a nice, low-growing, tufted type plant, um, very low about uh, using it as a ground cover. Uh, it is shade tolerant, so you know this can work in well where uh, you're using ferns and things like that. It is an evergreen one, uh, and this is uh, there's dwarf golden and golden, so it sort of has that chartreuse color. And you can see um, how this is nestled in against this light covered rock, uh, how it uh, sets itself off uh, against that rock. Um, so it's not going to be a very fast grower. Um, but it, it, it definitely fills in an area and does a nice job in order to give you uh, the presentation that you want. And then we have Carex. Now this is Phyllocephala. This is a sedge. And think of this as, uh, you know, it, I, I always like to look at it, it. They look like mini palm trees the way they come uh, from a central point uh, and then open up and clump uh, out over the area. Um, this is Sparkler, probably the most uh, prominent one in, in this species. It likes that moist soil, so it will do much better um, in the shade, um, maybe morning sun, uh, and in an area where, you know, it, it stays wet a little bit longer. Um, but this is one of the species, uh, Carex, where you can see there are quite a few other species out. There's Moroei, Oshimanensis, Glauca, and these all have some unique, very unique characteristics, very unique foliage. Um, and so it offers a lot of options um, if you like the look of these Carex. They all don't have this, you know, this little palm tree look. Some of them are clumper, some of them are a little bit more upright. Um, so Carex is one where there's been quite a bit of uh, uh, introductions and, and unique colors um, that have come onto the market. Uh, Chesmanthium, Latifolium, Inland Sea Oats. This is one of my favorites. I, I, I really like this. I, I love it when it, it, after it blooms and it sets seed. And that's what we're seeing here. Uh, it, it sort of reminds me of a, a, you know, a fishing pole with the, uh, a fish after you caught a fish hanging off of it, the way it nods down, it droops down. Um, these are very adaptable uh, to sun or shade. Um, and it's very um, uh, salt tolerant. So if you are along the coast, this is one that will do very well in your landscape. Uh, it is a native uh, to the US, so it, it performs extremely well. Um, landscape height is about four feet, and this is a summer bloomer. So um, uh, this inland sea oats is one that uh, just really adds a nice, nice texture and look to the landscape. Uh, Dianella, probably this is a uh, actually a, a native to uh, Australia, uh, and and so when I was doing new products, uh, I guess it was gosh, it's it, it's probably been about 15, 20 years um, when this first started coming in, and and I'm I'm always a little um, leery when we start bringing plants in from Australia because their conditions are much drier, much different growing conditions uh, than what we have here. But this plant does extremely well here. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with it. I, I had it in my landscape for quite a while. Honestly, I, I took it out because it, I just got tired of it and I wanted to put something else in. Um, but it, it's got this nice upright uh, habit, you know, sword shape foliage. Um, most of the times you'll see it variegated. This is the green and white variegation. There is also a green and gold variegation, which performs um, just as well. It, it will put up these very fine spikes in the summer, and it gets these nice little small star-shaped flowers. Uh, and then when they are pollinated, the, the berry will be like a turquoise blue. So it it's unique, it, it's, it doesn't wow you, um, but it, it's just a nice little extra uh benefit that the plant brings does well in full sun and part shade uh some of the varieties listed there are taz red uh, winina or or silver streak um the other thing is there's some other species out there revoluta and carula which also do uh extremely well and have a little bit more compact tighter habit and they start to get into the blues and, and this uh, silvery blue type foliage so dianella is one that um is is really it performs extremely well um it might get a little rust on the foliage every now and then but it usually it, it's never bad enough that it 
wipes it out. Um, the plant is very hardy and uh, it it just continues to uh, thrive. So um, it's one that performs very well here. Uh, Equisetum, if you want to add some height, if you want to add some uh, texture, if you want to have an architectural interest, uh, this horsetail rush is, is something that um, uh, you can incorporate. It's ideal. You'll see this a lot near uh, pond areas, koi ponds and things like that, or bog gardens. It loves wet feet. Um, uh, I've seen this in a two gallon pot put inside a large decorative pot that the that holds water uh, and that plant just continues to thrive. Uh, so it, it really has a uh, almost a, uh, a prehistoric type look to it, uh, like it's been around for for eons um, and, and does extremely well. It is a North American native and in the landscape, you know, over time, this will get about four feet in height. Uh, so it is, um, it, it will do extremely well uh, in a wet conditions. Uh, the Juncus uh, effusus, again, this is another one that will prefer um, some wet feet, uh, moist conditions, and the habit on this is more of that vase shape. Uh, it adds a nice structural element. You can see one, this one here is, uh, I believe it's either twister or big twister, uh, and it sort of has that corkscrew look as that foliage emerges. Or we have the uh, the typical juncus that is more of an upright fan shape, very fine foliage. Uh, you can see the uh, flowering down in through the base here, but it's got a, a, a very nice way that it presents itself and, and sort of will poke through some of the perennials as they're growing up around it. Uh, so it is adaptable uh, to the various conditions and uh, performs uh, extremely well. Uh, well next up, uh, yes. I have um, one person that says that they are no longer seeing the slides. Uh, here's a second person, so you may need to reshare. Uh, OK, I can do that or I'm if they want, they can. All right, I let me stop sharing and share again. The other option is they can hop off and uh, hop back in again. Uh, sometimes that will work also if they're having some problems, but let me go and do that. I, I'm still seeing them, but uh, OK, yes, yeah. the second person that said that they weren't able okay. to see them. So yeah, so what they what might want to do is just hop off and uh, hop back in again uh, and, and see if that works uh, better right. for that, them. They said it stopped at uh, Dianella. OK, all right. All right, so uh, next up is uh, Lariope um, or uh, that's the way I say it. I grew up in the Northeast. When I moved down here, pe people call it Liriope. So tomato, tomato, Liriope, Liriope. Uh, it, it just depends. As long as we're talking about, we know we're talking about the same plant when we're talking uh, about the, gen uh, the genus. Um, so uh, this is an evergreen uh, ground cover. Uh, height can vary anywhere from uh, 10 to 16 inches. Um, it, it, it has that sort of tufted look to it, um, works great edging out borders and things like that. Um, this one will produce a spike in the summer. It, it has clusters uh, along the stem of, of these bell-shaped bell -shaped flowers that are usually purple. Uh, and there are a lot of varieties out there. Um, big blue, silvery sunproof. So some of them are all green, some of them are uh, green and white variegation, others are green and gold variegation. So it, again, it depends on what you're looking for, what you need, um, where you can uh, use one of these uh, liriopes uh, in the mix. Uh, Miscanthus, this is Miscanthus sinensis, has been around for uh, quite a while uh, and performs extremely well. Um, has a nice mounding habit. Uh, once established, it is drought tolerant. So um, that's one thing that some people get uh, uh, confused about. They figure, well, if I plant it uh, in May and we go into a drought, you know, it says on the label that it's drought tolerant. Well, that plant still has to establish uh, uh, and get a good root system in. So, you know, when we hear about drought tolerance, it's it's normally the case of when that plant is 
establish that it will come through the other side of a drought, usually uh, without any major issues. Uh, it will tolerate poor soil, so it is a workhorse in a landscape, and it has winter interest because uh, it holds those seed heads. Uh, the foliage is, is uh, will change colors on it, so you'll get some fall color with it, things like that. Height really depends on the varieties, and you can see the number of varieties. This and this is just a short list of some of the varieties that are out there, but you can find this in that sort of in that two and a half foot range at maturity on up to an eight foot range. Uh, and this will bloom, you know, in the late summer. Uh, so it, it, it is a plant that um, needs space in most cases, uh, some of the varieties, um, but it just performs uh, extremely well. And here's some of the varieties. So you can see uh, on the left-hand side, this is strictus. So it's got that nice upright habit. And then you can see the, uh, the flowers uh, as, as it's blooming. So a nice contrast with that coppery red color to it. Uh, and then we see on the right hand side, we see morning light where we've got horizontal uh, variegation bands in it, which adds a, a, a completely different look. Uh, and just really when it's not in bloom, uh, draws your eye and, and, and adds some interest to it. Uh, look at Gracilimus here. This is in the fall. So look at that nice color and then the, the, uh, the seed pods uh, held above it. So it, it, it gives you that nice interest. And if there was a breeze, you would see that breeze moving through it. Uh, and then there's variegata. So here's uh, a green and white variegated. And those seed heads have that nice reddish pink color to it uh, held above it. So, um, you know, the interest with the, the miscanthus, uh, depending on the season and, and the type of plant, even when it's not in bloom or uh, in seed set, um, is very unique and, and can bring something uh, into those beds. Mullenbergia is probably one of my other favorites, Capillaris. We see it a lot now, um, but just look at that. It, it just looks like it's a, a, a pink mist uh, over the top of that that plant when it's in bloom. So it's a nice, soft, feathery. You just want to take your hand and, and run it over the top of it. Uh, it is a native. Uh, it is heat and drought tolerant, again, once established. And then these pink blooms in the fall, uh, you just, you, you can't miss it. Um, you see this a lot more uh, in developments as you enter, they're lining them or in corporate parks, they're using it. And it just provides such a wow factor uh, as you come in. Uh, mature heights about three to four feet, depending on the variety. Uh, and there is a, a white uh, variety of it uh, called white cloud. Uh, so we've got the pink and the white. So depending on your uh, preference, uh, you can go with either one. Um, but the pinks, you know, you, you, you just can't go wrong with it. Uh, and it is an easy plant to grow, establishes quickly. And then year after year, that plant just comes back and puts on a great show. Uh, Ophiopogon, uh, Japonicus, Mondo grass, again, another uh, one that the landscape industry uses quite a bit, um, much more tight, tighter habit, clumping habit. The foliage isn't as wide uh, as it is with regard to, say, uh, when we talked about the Lariope. Uh, Ophiopogon's got a much uh, thinner blade to it, um, often used as a ground cover or for low borders. Uh, again, this one has uh, lilac flowers also, but they bloom in the summer. Uh, landscape height is anywhere from that 12 to 15 inch range. Um, some of the varieties for uh, Japonicus are Nanus, which is what we're seeing here on the, uh, the right hand side. And then there's one called Nigrescens, which has a dark, dark uh, purple, almost like a black type foliage. Um, if you see it, and it, it, it's definitely a novelty. Um, when we had it in production, the, the one knock on it is it is very slow to grow. Um, so as a specimen plant, it's great, but you you usually don't see a lot of it in in the trade um, because it is a very slow grower. Just to fill out a small, you know, four inch pot takes quite a while. There are some other species like Jabberin. Uh, a plant escapus jabberin is much taller um, and, and jabberin all, almost looks like a liriope. Uh, so the only way you would be able to tell the difference is, is from the flower. Um, but again, various uh, different species within the same genus uh, gives you a different look and a different presentation. 
Panicum is another very strong workhorse uh, uh, in the uh, ornamental grass uh, area. Uh, switchgrass does extremely well. Uh, it is native to North America. It's very adaptable and it, pro it produces these clouds of uh, seed heads that, that sit well above the foliage. Um, tolerant of dry conditions, this one blooms in the midsummer. Uh, again, this is another one where we've seen a lot of new introductions here lately. And this is just uh, a few of them that are listed. Um, and there's plenty more. One of the resources um, uh, that uh, the guys can put in is, is uh, that I have is for Hoffman uh, Nursery. Uh, all they do is they're a wholesaler, but it's a great resource. It's a great reference. Um, great images, lots of good information. So it can give you an idea of, of where and how to use these uh, plants. But here's ruby ribbons and cloud nine. Look at the variation, the difference in, in the heights and how these seed heads are held above it. Um, nice airy look, open, um, extremely hardy plant that does uh, very well. And then we have Shenandoah and Dallas Blue. So Shenandoah is a little bit more upright, a little bit more columnar um, than the other ones. And Dallas Blues has these nice white flowers but it's got that silvery bluish type foliage. So it's a nice contrast when this is, um, you know, in bloom and setting seed, they, uh, they do extremely well. Uh, Penicetums, there's multiple species of Penicetums. This is fountain grass, the Allopicoroides, um, great for borders or as a specimen, has a nice fine foliage, you know, not real broad um, in that foliage, very drought tolerant, um, the plumes, uh, it, this flowers in midsummer, so probably uh, you might start to see some of them uh, blooming, starting to bloom now, but usually by August is when you're going to you see these come into uh, play. Uh, and landscape height, depending on the variety, um, is anywhere from a foot and a half on up to six feet. So these can get very big and can get quite big. Uh, you know, a plant like, uh, and I know this little bunny is probably going to be about a foot, foot and a half, uh, but some of these other ones are going to get quite tall. But again, a, a different perspective with the way that seed head and that flower uh, looks. Here's a, a couple of them. Here is redhead. Uh, in bloom, and you can see sort of radiates from a center point um, with these flower heads. Um, very nice presentation above the perennials, so it, it, it has a really nice look. And then we have something like Cassian, which it has a more of a, a white uh, uh, flower and, and seed head to it. Again, but that same type of habit where it comes up and um, flowers and then arches over the perennials and, and adds a nice uh, accent look to it. Now they, we've got another penicid and this is cetacean, purple fountain grass. And you'll see these a lot, um, especially rubrum uh, in the fall of the year is, is when we start to see these um, from the growers and things like that. Um, sort of like a, a nice cattail type uh, flower head to it. it. It is a tender perennial. So down for the Gulf Coast for us, um, a lot of times these, depending on how cold we get, I, I would tend to think that after this uh, February freeze, um, a lot of these probably took a hit. If you are up in the Dallas area, it's, it's, you're going to treat it as an annual. Uh, it probably won't uh, perennialize for you. Um, the further south you go, you'll you'll pre you may get a few years out of it um, before it, it it might take a hit or or it just sort of uh, dies out on its own. But it's got this nice purple foliage uh, and then these nice flowers that um, uh, add a nice accent to it. Uh, the the one that really has a, a really nice wow factor is this one here. This is fireworks, uh, and just look at the foliage on that and the way they. Uh, uh, the, the flowers work amongst it. So this is a, where instead of just having one specimen, they, they clumped them. There's probably about four or five plants there uh, and just a wow factor. So even when that's not in bloom, um, that, that foliage is going to draw your eye and you can see how it plays off of the other colors there uh, in the landscape. And then we have another penicetum. All right. So this is napier grass. 
Um, they, these are hybrids. Uh, several of these are Texas superstars, Princess and Black Stockings. Uh, and this is uh, a lot of breeding uh, on this variety or this species has come out of the University of Georgia. But they have a really nice look to them, uh, uh, sort of that uh, graceful, uh, that nice fountain habit. Uh, you can see the, the shorter one here. I believe this is uh, Princess or Princess Caroline. Uh, it, it almost looks like one of those Dracaenas or something or, or a Cordyline. You know, it's, it, it's more low growing, um, fills in the spot uh, and, and adds a, a nice color to it. This is black stockings. Uh, so this is a plant that's going to get about uh, six to eight feet tall. But again, that nice upright chocolatey type uh foliage uh, and then it just sort of cascades down and over so um, they they perform extremely well I was really surprised I've got black stockings at the house here and it made it through the freeze I was not expecting it um, to make it uh, I have it in the bed that's on the east side of the house I have it in a bed uh, that's on the um, west side of the house and they all came back and they're thriving so i i thought for sure i was going to lose it uh but this plant i i was really surprised at how well it did from the freeze uh that we had here in february so um this napier grass um, is another one that that really does well even in containers uh you could use this as a container plant uh and 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 um really enjoy uh its presentation so um, with that, um, I want to thank you for joining us. And I guess I'll ask the team if there are any questions uh, that I can answer that were posted. There have not been any. OK. Uh, evidently, you've done such an excellent job of, of presenting that uh, you answered the questions as you went along. So well, that is awesome. Um, I like when I hear that. This way I know I'm covering all the bases and uh, everybody's getting the information that they need. So uh, I guess since we don't have any other questions, I will go ahead and uh, close it out. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us for Gardening in the Gulf Coast. Um, again, I'm Paul Winsky with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension here in Harris County. Uh, and then please uh, join us and register for our next presentation, which will be held on August 4th. And our own Kevin Gibbs from Nueces County will be speaking on Lantana varieties for the Gulf Coast landscape. So um, with that, thank you for joining us uh, and have a great day. Thanks, Paul. Great job. All right. Thank you.